I want to be more like Regina B. As I often do when I'm teaching change leadership, I canvass the group as to their thoughts around change. And Regina B., with her fiery red hair and her equally bright and effervescent disposition, literally leapt up, waved her arms in the air, and exclaimed, I love change. Wow. I had never before experienced that and ever since. We talk a lot in change about managing change and change leadership, and we talk about change frequency and embracing change. We also talk about change resistance. We talk about change fatigue. We talk about change failure. We talk about change for the sake of change. But we rarely, if ever, talk about loving change. So you probably noticed I'm not famous. I haven't summited Mount Everest. I haven't summited Mount Robson. I haven't beat an incurable disease, and I don't live with a debilitating one. I'm not a sport hero, and I'm not a celebrity. What I am is always learning. And so here goes a little bit about what I think around change resiliency, what I'm reading, what I'm thinking about, and more importantly, what I wonder about change and resiliency. So I immensely enjoy the outdoors, and I think it's a great teacher of change. A few years ago, I hiked the 77-kilometer West Coast Trail with a 57-pound pack on my back, including everything you need for a week, and as it turns out, a few things you probably don't need. So I learned some things on that trail. I learned three things that I can apply to change and life and resiliency. One was to unplug for perspective. The me that returned was definitely a better version of the me that left, leaving behind schedules and roles and routines and expectations and even makeup was such a gift and a blessing. Two, I learned that I could thrust my pack weight, the detriment, into either a step up or a lean in, and I could use that detriment to propel me forward. And three, I learned just one step. With the big pressing decision for the day being, which campsite are we headed to? We had the freedom to really savor nature, each other, the scenery, and the bliss of being together. One step at a time, one foot in front of the other. And so when I think resiliency, one of the people that I think about is Sheryl Sandberg. Sheryl is the author of Lean In. She's a mom. She's the COO of Facebook and she is an ambassador for Lean In Communities and Circles. And on the 30th day of mourning the death of her husband, Dave Goldberg, she published a heart-wrenchingly beautiful tribute. What about the children dad activities, she asked a friend. I wanted option A. I wanted Dave. To which her friend replied, Cheryl, we are going to kick the crap out of option B. And it wasn't really crap. You can figure it out, what she really said. And so, option B. One of my most profound changes, one that I will never ever embrace, but I do try to learn from, is the unexpected loss and death of my partner Trevor. Friend, son, brother, dad, love, mentor, role model, number one fan of dancer daughter, number one fan of swimmer daughter, community builder, coach, elite triathlete, record holding sprint cyclist, yoga teacher, marathon runner, and owner of a heart with atrial fibrillation. It's hard for me to say what was and is the most difficult about that loss and that significant change. And so it's the same in business. 
change is our reality and the pace of change is absolutely greater than ever. John Cotter, Harvard professor, uh, strategic leadership and change and guru, speaks of the need to accelerate our change leadership mentality. We need to move more to a leadership driven focus away from the management focus on planning, organizing, budgeting, etc. Cotter asserts that we need to accelerate this leadership driven mentality in order to stay ahead. The globe is shrinking and change leadership is drastically needed. Uh, in one of our leadership classes, we discuss Mother Teresa and the culture of leadership that she created in her organization and all around the world. Uh, there's a story of her being invited to do a big keynote address where she was with world uh, leaders, dignitaries, politicians. It, she was much uh, awaited her very anticipated speech. She finally walked forward very slowly to the mic, leaned forward and said, love one another. So a few years ago, I was walking to deliver a keynote address downtown right at the same time that I was contemplating a change to teaching, speaking and consulting full time. And I looked down on the sidewalk and there was stenciled in the sidewalk, a little message that said, do what you love. Cool. Do what you love. So if I said to you, New York and resiliency, what would you say? So I can see you. What would you say if I said New York and resiliency? 9-11. I would as well. Thank you. 9-11 and ground zero. So I visited New York recently and two things really struck me. First, the resiliency of New Yorkers. Wow building this beautiful monument to the loves that they lost uh, in that tragedy. The museum is fantastic as well. And the very symbolic One World Trade Center, also known as Freedom Tower. The other thing about my visit to Ground Zero uh, in New York that really speaks to resiliency of New Yorkers and resiliency in general is the other thing you see pictured in this in this photograph, and that is a pear tree. It was on the site, significantly damaged, and now I'm happy to say is gloriously flourishing. Quite remarkable. In fact, it's been dubbed Survivor Tree. Freedom Tower and Survivor Tree. Talk about resiliency. While in New York City, I also paid a pilgrimage to Strawberry Fields to pay my respects to John Lennon. And I want to invite you to join me in reciting this one, one line. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world can live as one. Imagine. What are you grateful for? I am grateful to be here today. I'm grateful that you're all here. And I'm grateful for one other thing that I want to talk about. Wait for it. Are you ready? I am grateful for neuroplasticity. <laughs> Dead sexy, isn't it? I think our brains are so amazing. And there's some things that we know intellectually about change. We know that it's the external, it's the event that happens, it's the thing that happens. And then we also know there's transition and that's the piece around the psychological repatterning for us to come to terms with change. That's where our brains are very much engaged around change. So if you've read uh, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor's uh, incredible story, My Stroke of Insight, uh, she's a brain re researcher. She chronicled her own massive stroke in real time. She knew exactly what was happening in her brain. And it's more miraculous because she has since made a full recovery. You will know if you read that story about the beauty and awesomeness of our brains and how they help us during change. I read a really fascinating story about the Mokin people. They're also known as the sea gypsies. And so they live nomadically on the sea uh, between what um, Myanmar, formerly Burma, 
and Thailand. They live at sea, they're born at sea, they die at sea, and they rarely come ashore, only during monsoon season. The Mokan people have evolved and they have changed dramatically to learn to live uh, in that different environment. What they've done is they've been able to uh, alter their vision and override their nervous system so that they can adapt and they can see up to incredible distances underwater. They also have developed the capacity to free dive up to 30 meters. Talk about adapting uh, and changing. Um, as another book I'd like to share with you by Daryl Connor, and I use it in my teaching a little and in my practice as well. And closer to home, the devastating Fort McMurray fire is a scenario where we all hope and pray for resiliency. Firefighting experts have called it the beast. And interestingly, that's a term that Connor also uses to describe what he calls the implications from change. He says it's often not the change event, and I would agree, it's not the change event itself, but the implications that cause problems. Daryl Connor has applied years of research to come up with and define five characteristics of resilient people. So Connor says that resilient people, one, display a sense of security and self-assurance based on their view of life as complex, but filled with opportunity. Resilient people are positive. Two, Resilient people have a clear vision of what they want to achieve. Resilient people are focused. Three, resilient people demonstrate a special pliability when responding to uncertainty. Resilient people are flexible. Four, resilient people develop structured approaches to managing ambiguity. Resilient people are organized. And five, resilient people engage change rather than defending against it. Resilient people are proactive. I'm uh, increasingly convinced that this thing called change, leadership, and resiliency is very much an inside job. It's very personal. And I think that the poet Rumi got it right centuries ago when he said, Yesterday, I was so clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today, I am wise, so I am changing myself. Thank you.